Morning, everyone. Uh, glad to be here, and it's a beautiful day out there. They do say that there was a little rain for the uh, eastern, uh, well, all through Highway 40, I guess, starting in the west. <laughs> so we hope that you'll get some. Well, our uh, lesson for today in the sermon is um, about prayer, and we could say how to ask in prayer, how to ask in prayer, what to say. Well, there's an awful lot of uh, prayers recorded in the scripture. It's amazing some of the prayers that are in the scriptures. So we want to uh, uh, not look at those particularly, but I'd like to have you take a look at what is in the uh, in those prayers. Sometimes start, start thinking about where was a prayer said. Uh, the dedication of uh, the temple was one fantastic time when they had a, a great prayer. And then there's others that are, that are uh, said in the scriptures. So for a key verse here that we're going to take apart, it's uh, ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. That's Matthew 7 verse 7. So this, uh, if we took it in three pieces, it would be ask would be the first part, ask in simplicity, Second one would be seek, but seek in intensity. And the last one would be knock, but knock with perseverance. So uh, we'll look at, at some things first before I get into that too far. I'd like to show you somewhere prayer was not answered. The Bible always shows both sides, right? <laughs> it shows the pros and the cons. It shows you what doesn't work and what does work. So turn with me to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Now start with verse 24, but 25 is the one I'm really after. And I might read a couple more verses there as well. But Luke 13, verse 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. There is some key to getting this to work right for us. That part of it is today, but there's a lot of little keys that go along with getting God's attention or getting to the straight gate and walking the straight and narrow way for the Lord. So we need to strive, persevere, struggle with, make sure we're going the right way and, and work, with, work at it hard. So verse 25 now, when once the master of the house is risen up, Jesus is telling kind of a story here. He said, now, the master was resting, sitting, relaxing for the evening, and all of a sudden he gets up. He's going to do something. And he has shut the door. So when he gets up and he goes and shuts the door for the house, he's going to lock up for the night. And ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. And he's saying this to the people that really should know. And they're the ones that are the Hebrew people. They're believing in the Bible. They're supposed to be believing the right way. They're living the right way. But they don't know Christ. So something is wrong there. He's trying to pre-warn them that there's a day coming when there's more to the story. So the door is shut, and all of a sudden they can't get in. There's no opening after it's shut. They need to prepare. They need to be something done first. So let's do 26, 27, and 28 as well. This is Jesus talking. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourself thrust out. Now, that's them thinking of their Israelites. They go to the temple. They saw Jesus teaching. They heard the teachings of the Bible. They heard the Bible read. 
that they know him and they're trying to convince him saying well, well you were in our streets you know, we're on your side you know we're one of the guys <laughs> it doesn't work that way there's something deeper that has to be done something deeper and that's part of my thoughts today is what what is deeper because if you don't do it Jesus is going to say I don't know where you came from I don't know who you are and they're trying to say hey you walked in Jerusalem God's special city and, and we live here but there's something missing in their life and because they're going to miss out there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth because they're not going to be in the kingdom that's what it's saying that God, God's kingdom is coming and they're all these other folks are going to be in the kingdom and you're not going to make it. but we, we've got to make sure that we're there that we're right with God long before the whistle blows you know before the trumpets blow before the end gets near we, we need to know where we are and part of that is in prayer so that's somebody that doesn't get in how about Matthew 7 Matthew 7 turn with me to Matthew 7 the other verse I just used was in Matthew 7 but I want to go to verses a couple more down the page because we always need to read the um, the before verses and the after verses to make sure we get the contents of it and all of this chapter 5, 6, and 7 is all in red this is Jesus writing, it's Jesus speaking that somebody wrote down for us to, to get so chapter 7 verse 21 I'll read 22 and 23 here as well not everyone that saith unto me unto Jesus, Lord, Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now there's one of the keys. If you want to get into the kingdom, you need to be doing that. So not everybody that comes along and says, well, Lord, I know you. I know your name. I know who you are. Doesn't the scripture say that the devils believe and tremble? Oh, yeah. They know who Jesus is. But they're not going to get in. So here's another chance where... If you know him, you need to be doing the will of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The naming of Jesus' name will bring results. Praying over somebody and announcing that Jesus is the one that does the healing can bring results. But do you know Jesus? Is He your Lord and Master and Savior? That's the big difference, isn't it? We need to make that one extra step because we, we need to be in a better position than than just barely making it or not sure that we're going to make it. So the first thing is uh, prayer, asking in prayer. Because when we ask, we expect to get results, right? When you're, when you're a real little and kids come along and they say, uh, you know, can I have such and such? And they're pretty plain about everything, aren't they? They just ask for what they need. Turn with me to, to verses 9 and 10 right here in the same chapter, Matthew 7. 9 and 10. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son asked bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked a fish, will give him a serpent? He said, you, you folks are better than that. You know, you're better parents than that. You'll give what's requested. Especially if it's something that you know that the children need. They need food. They need clothing. And so they need to be warm. They need to be loved. And that will come to them. And this is an example of our Heavenly Father knowing our needs and what's best for us. We're the children of God. So we need to ask in a childlike way. And so in verse 11 here, if ye then being evil, just ordinary human folks here, fallen mankind, right? You were born in sin, you're a fallen nation of, uh, of peoples. Uh, he said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, shall your Father, 
which is in heaven, give good gifts to them that ask him. Ask. I need to ask. I've had two nests of birds in my yard, probably more that I didn't get involved in. And the little ones are crying for food. And boy, those parents are going back and forth, back and forth, bringing food. And then when we get out there and want to cut the grass or walk out there, boy, they start chattering and carrying on, you know, get out of the way. Leave me alone with my kids asking for something. <laughs> kids asking for food. But we as, as examples of God, you know, we're, we're made in the image of God. We have those feelings in us even more so as to caring for our children and caring for their needs. And God is the overall example of caring for our needs. That he knows what's good for us. And if we ask him, he will give it to us. So the prayers, asking in prayer. We need to keep asking and, uh, and do whatever it takes to be with God on his side. Verse 8. I've left out on purpose because I wanted it this time. So let's go to verse 8. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and he that knocketh, it shall be opened unto him. Verse 7, use those three points. So this verse 8 is going back over it again. Everyone that will ask, if you do the job, if you'll ask, pray, get on the right wavelength with the Heavenly Father, that you're going to receive. You're going to get results for your prayers. Sometimes there's a little gap because we're not old enough to receive it. <laughs> God has to say you've got to wait a little bit. Right? But he's there wanting to give it to us. And he that seeketh, we go after God. Try to find him. Find out who he is, what he is, what his personality is, what he hates, what he likes, what he loves, what's an abomination to him. Yeah, a good deal. But if we'll seek him, we'll find him. And to him that knocks, that's not just one little tap and, well, I guess he's not home. You stay there and you knock and knock and knock and knock, asking for him to come. Stay diligent at the job of getting attention. Those little baby birds, they just keep crying. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> That's what we need to be doing too, is to looking to the Heavenly Father for our needs and keep asking, keep knocking, and it'll be open unto us. So let's go and look at some verses on seeking. First thing that came to my mind was to, if we seek, we'll find, but turn with me first to this prayer in 2 Chronicles. I always like to give homework. And boy, if you could just get a handle on this and enjoy it, in chapter um, 6 and 7, uh, the prayers that, uh, that are said here, I guess it's mainly chapters, chapter 6, all the way from the beginning to the last verse, is all really great prayer that Solomon was making before the Heavenly Father, talking with him. So we can find out how to talk to God, how to seek Him. But uh, in this prayer, verse uh, 12 and 13, and he stood before the altar of God in, in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hand. His hands. We would be kind of shy to do that, wouldn't we? There's nothing wrong with it. Come to church, if you wanted to stand up front here and, and hold out your hands and ask God for something. That's exactly what he was doing. He wasn't acting in a proud way. Any strange kind of mannerism, he was being being polite to God, he was being reverence to God. But he came and he stood there and he spread forth his hands. Verse 13. For Solomon had made a, a brazen scaffold of five cubits long and five cubits broad and three cubits high and had set it in the midst of the court and upon it he stood. You know what everybody's going to notice? He's not trying to be proud. Remember Jesus said, when you want to pray, don't stand on the street corners and have your robe on and your prayer cloth and you know your hands folded. Or yeah. Don't let people know that you're praying. But what's he doing here? He's just being honest with God. He was 
I, I'm up here one step. So that you can see me, right? That's all he was doing. He was getting up high enough that people could see what was going on. He's trying to draw their attention to the Heavenly Father. He's going to make a prayer to the Heavenly Father. So he's getting them to join him in prayer. What else did he do? And knelt down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel. They saw him. How did he behave in prayer? He knelt down. And they saw what kind of attitude he had towards the Heavenly Father. He knelt. And he spread forth his hands towards heaven. This is a proper behavior of prayer. This is not something funny or something strange that if somebody wanted to kneel in prayer, when we said, everybody stand, we're going to have prayer. If somebody knelt, nobody's going to get excited. They're doing that to God. They have some petition on their heart. They want to be closer to God. They're seeking with intensity. That's all they do. They do it for show. I think they find out. <laughs> okay. But that's not the idea. He was doing it here in honor to the Heavenly Father. And then he goes and says his prayer. And you read his prayer. He was not being strange at all in what he said to the Heavenly Father. He was being very serious with God. So that's all the way down to the end of the chapter there. Seeking will bring us discovery. And we'll find our God. Get closer to, to the Heavenly Father. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13. 29 verse 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Search for him with all your heart. I like to read even further than that. At least a verse or two. You could always go back to verse 10. Start reading from there down. And, um, this prayer. and uh, How it fits in with this, this uh, verse 13. But God is talking to him. He said, when you seek me, you will find me. Seek me and find me. When? Something we've got to be doing. When you search for me with all your heart. Put your whole heart into the thing. You know, many times we want to study something else, we want to know about this, or we want to know about that, and we put our whole heart into it, right? That's a common everyday saying. Well, how about faith? How about the scriptures? Same idea. Put your whole heart into it. But look at verse 14. Count how many times it says, I will. This is God talking to you. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. I will turn away your captivity, I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you and, uh, not and, uh, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again to this place whence I caused you to be carried away. What's the solution to getting these things for us? You know, what's in it for me? Searching, searching for God with all of our heart. God will give us the desires of our heart. They wanted to go back. If you read the prayer again from Solomon, he was saying, if anybody looks towards this city or turns their body this way and prays to you at the temple that's in Jerusalem, Lord, hear their prayers and answer their prayers. Guess where they were? They were in captivity. If they prayed toward Jerusalem, God was going to hear them. Because that's what Solomon said. Please do that for us, Heavenly Father. When we go astray, if we pray towards this city, if we pray towards this temple. By the way, read about that temple. Wow! It was phenomenal. And after it was built, all of the wealth that came into the, into the country because of God blessing them. An amazing, amazing thing. So God will bring those special things to us. If we'll search deeper and richer to find our full understanding of the Heavenly Father and about His Son, Jesus Christ. There's a lot of treasures to be had there. Uh, in Psalm 91, turn with me to Psalm 91. You can always pick out certain individual words in these verses. You probably know Psalm 91 really well. But think on a few of these verses. He that dwelleth in the secret place 
of the Most High dwelleth. Search with all your heart. You want to live there. It becomes part of you. You want to be there. So if you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Because we know Him so well, we can say this, if we really know Him. He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. This is not only just bugs. This is missiles that fly by day and night. You've been reading in the newspapers? Oh yeah. I forget the number, how many? Was it 200 and something? Missiles that flew? And a high percentage Israel knocked them down with their iron dome, which is like our Patriot missiles, I suppose. They were able to shoot them down. When they fire, when the enemy fires the missile from either um, Lebanon or from Gaza or elsewhere, but they actually know the track of that missile and where it's going to land. If it's just going to land in their field, they leave it alone, just let it go. They watch for the next one that's going to a city or a place of population. They can decide before that missile lands whether they should go after it or not. And they knock those missiles out of the air. Is man able to do it? No, it's God that gives the knowledge and the wisdom and the ability to get it and all of those things. Absolutely amazing. God is blessing that country. And then verse 4 as well. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. That's where our trust needs to be. We need to seek God in that way that we have a deeper walk with him. If you were seeking something of this world, I, I got the thinking right away, you know, these things go through my head when I'm studying at home. So I like to bring show and tell, right? <laughs> if you're seeking for gold, you'd probably buy a book, this is the Panhandler's Manual, manual. Panhandler's Manual for panning gold. And you might some, find some of that white stuff too. Kind of silvery looking stuff, platinum. It's just as heavy as gold, just about. And here is the guide to gold panning in British Columbia. So if you were going to go there, you would get this out and find out where those gold mines were and where those rivers are. Where's our manual? Right here. We need to know this manual, right? We need to read it and study and find those nuggets of gold, those special treats that are hidden in the scriptures. It's our manual for life. But if we were going after this, we'd go at it all wholeheartedly, right? You'd get the right equipment, the right places, the right tools, and travel, the right maps. You'd go right after it, right? How about following God with all your heart, soul, and mind, searching for Him, going after Him? But you know, there's precious souls out there that are far more precious than gold and silver. And we need to seek those lost. We sing that song sometimes, Seeking the Lost. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 12. This is Old Testament, isn't it? Daniel chapter 12. What has he got to say about seeking the lost? Seeking souls that we need to find. Chapter 12, verse 3. And they that are that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many unto righteousness shall be as stars forever and ever. Here's one of those little gold nuggets. Hidden way back here in Daniel, it's supposed to be prophecy only. Oh, well, not really, right? <laughs> and here's a little nugget in here that if we will turn people to righteousness, if we'll work at winning souls for Christ, turn their hearts to righteousness, we'll shine as stars forever and ever. It sounds real good to me, anyway. 
I don't know if I want to be a star, but boy, I'll tell you, I want to be in that group when they start singing the praises at the end of the world and singing hallelujah to the Lord and so on. I want to be there. You know, sometimes when I started thinking about some of these things about rivers for finding gold or rivers in the Bible, I looked at different verses last night, spent a fair amount of time struggling to find the one I wanted, and then it wasn't just what I wanted. But they, there's a verse that says that you've got to put your feet in the water. And this angel measured up the, the distance, and it was a thousand cubits from here to here, you know, a thousand cubits. And he took him out in the water and he said, the water didn't get very deep, it was up to the ankles kind of, and so the angel took him another one of those, a thousand cubits in distance out in the water, and then it was up to his knees. And then he went out another thousand cubits and it was up to his waistline. And I'm thinking, no, we need to get in the water. There's even a song like that. Step, step into the water. <laughs> it was a famous song a while back. But step out. We gotta do. Put our feet first in the water. Get going. Get it, you know, you can't get anywhere from here to there unless you get your feet wet. You say, you know, gotta get into the job or into something. Well, do you remember when the priest crossed the Jordan River? So the priests had to walk out into the water, get their feet wet, carrying the ark, and walk out into the water, and then all of a sudden the water started dividing and stood up, and it was flood stage. And the River Jordan stopped on this side, and the other one ran away, I guess, and uh, God made a dry land for them to walk across there, as well as back in Egypt, when they crossed on dry ground, that the priests had to put their feet in the water. Remember the eunuch and Philip? He said, I think I want to be baptized. Or he said, I know I want to be baptized. And Philip said, are you sure? And he said, yes, I am. And he said, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wanted to be baptized. He had to put his feet in the water. <laughs> he had to go into the water and get baptized and come out of the water after it was over. Do you remember the king that had leprosy in Syria? And he went to the prophet in Israel and he told him a very simple thing to do, and he didn't want to do it, because that water was muddy. <laughs> he had to go in there, and he did. He wanted to get healed. The servant said to him, hey, if he asks you a hard thing to do, you do it. And he said, all he's asking you to do is to dip yourself in this water seven times. So I can imagine he walked in, but he had to put his feet in the water. But he walked in, dipped himself, got himself back up, I don't feel any different. Now, I don't know if he walked ashore and walked back in, but he had to dip himself seven times before he was cured, completely cured of leprosy. We've got to get serious with God. We've got to get in the deep water so that we can get under it, <laughs> get down, and put our feet in the water, get deep in there. So we need to turn with our faith to getting deep with the Lord. Take the action. The last part there says in the verse that we had in Matthew 7, 7, to knock and it shall be opened. We're going to knock with persistency. Take the action. Go for it. And a lot of prayer and fasting. Uh, I've noted sometimes in various readings when you look at some certain word like fasting, it doesn't say if you fast. The Bible says, when you fast. I think we need to do it more often. <laughs> You've got to think about it and do that more often. That we should fast and pray. Get serious with God. Pray in the night. Pray in the day. Be persistent. We need that deep knowledge of God that will give us faith. And faith will give us results in our prayer life. So be persistent. If you wanted to read in uh, Isaiah, all of the chapters 44 and 45, you would be amazed. But let's go to chapter 45. Isaiah 45. And I'm just going to read a couple of verses. Chapter 45, in the first three verses. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, now wait a minute, he was a king that was not of the Israelite families and so on. 
But God has anointed him to do his work. He's going to have to do certain things. Those uh, whose right hand I have holden. God is taking Cyrus by the hand and he's going to have him do something. To subdue nations before him. And I will um, loose the loins of the kings to open before him the two leaved gates. Now this is some kind of gate that had special leaves on it. There's closing, special way of closing. And the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass. I will cut asunder the bars of iron. God is doing this. He doesn't have to do it. God's going to do it. But he's got to obey God. He's got to get deep with God, serve God. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which called thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. When he was doing these things, and miracles were happening, that he could get into these cities, that he could conquer this land, that he could put them all under his control, and he was being used of God, so that he could not say later, I don't know this God. He had opportunity to serve God. If you read all about these the, the children of Israel's captivity in Babylon, it'll amaze you how many times God witnessed all these people, giving them an opportunity to join in the family of God and to be here. So you might want to read all of this. It's amazing how many times in here uh, it says, I am the Lord, there is none else. There is no other God besides me. Uh, I am the Lord, there is none else. I am the uh, God, the Creator. I am the Creator. Um, uh, I am God the salvation, Savior, there is none besides me. I am God, there is none else. Uh, that thou, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. What did we talk about bowing this morning and kneeling? Whoa, we better do it before we're forced to, right? <laughs> I think we need to love the Lord in a way that it's not a problem to kneel down. It's not a problem to say this God is my God, this Savior is my Savior, in a way that we're willing to kneel to this person and surrender to him. That's an amazing chapter. You need to read this 45 and 46, I think, or 44 to 45 actually. And here it's really good. Turn with me to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 18. Look at verse 44. 1 Kings chapter 18, 44. When we want to get deep with God and really want to serve Him so that He can work with us and that we can work on His side, this was Elijah that had just performed miracle situations. He had stopped the rain for three and a half years. The Old Testament kind of makes it sound like Three years? But what does it say in the New Testament? Three and a half years. Okay. It's always neat to see those connections from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So Elijah went up to Mount, top of Mount Carmel in verse 42. 43, he says to his servant, you go and look and see if there's rain coming. And he said to him, go seven times. Now you think Elijah, after all of these miracles he's just done, He's the man of God. He knows God. He should just say it once. But what did we just look at here? That we need to knock with persistence. Knock with persistence. So he said to him the first time, he said, do you see any rain yet? No, no rain. So he prayed again. And he said, oh, won't see again. And he had to do it seven times. Persistence in prayer. Seven times. And then verse 44, and in the seventh time, he said, Behold, a little cloud comes out of the sea. It's like the size of a man's hand. Then he said, Go quickly and tell Ahab he better get his chariot going because he's going to be stopped by the rain. <laughs> That's faith. God is going to answer this prayer. He said, I, I got faith that that little cloud is going to bring it down for. And sure enough, it did. 
faith, persistence in prayer, not just one prayer, but pray. You know, I think so many times that we, we need to pray for our families, pray for our children, pray for our parents, but pray for our children, pray for our grandchildren, pray for our great-grandchildren, pray for the people that come to church, pray for those that don't come to church that should. Okay. Pray always. Pray so many prayers that we get serious with God. And don't give up. Don't quit. Don't faint. Mark 13, 13 says, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That's pers perseverance and endurance. To stay at it until the end. Galatians 6 and verse 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. We want our children, our grandchildren, to find salvation and to be in God's kingdom, God's forever, to find salvation. Pray and don't give up. <laughs> don't stop. Just keep praying. If we ask simply in prayer, with faith believing in the results, we're claiming the results, some people say, well, Pray, believing that there is going to be results. Ask. Then seek in prayer intensely, whether it's with fasting or with prayer, however you want to do it, if it's kneeling, if it's some other way that you find very close to God, do it. So that you are intensely seeking God and then be persevering in prayer. May God bless you.